The First Nighter Program, starring Olin Soule and Barbara Luddy. <laughs> Theater Time, Broadway. And here we are, ready to attend another thrilling premiere at the famous Little Theater off Times Square. Yes, it's one of the most exciting events on the Great White Way, an opening night. And here is our host for the evening, the genial first-nighter, Rye Billsbury. Good evening. I'm delighted you could join us. Tonight's play, I hear, is exceptionally good. Here's my cab. Won't you step in? All right, driver, to the Little Theater. Up Broadway, across 42nd Street and into the greatest nighttime playground in the world. There ahead is the little theater off Times Square. Well, here we are. Have your tickets ready, please. Have your tickets ready, please. Good evening, Mr. First Nighter. The usher will show you to your seats. Thank you. We'll go right in. Here we are, ladies and gentlemen. And in the packed house, we're surrounded by people whose names are news. But let me tell you about the play. It's a comedy romance entitled Speak Ever So Gently by Peggy Blake. Our two stars, Barbara Luddy and Olin Soule. Mr. Soule is cast as a motion picture star and Barbara Luddy as his publicity agent. In the all-star supporting cast are Betty Lou Gerson as Roxanne, Mary McGovern as Billy, and Eddie Firestone. Curtain! First curtain! There's the signal for first curtain. The house lights are out. And here's the play. Think of it, David. You, dedicating a children's home, a home for poor, unfortunate children in Beaver, Ohio. You, coming down off the silver screen to make this lovable human gesture. America's favorite actor, emerging from Hollywood as Atlantis emerged from the ocean. Atlantis didn't emerge. Atlantis sank. You get what I mean? I talked it over with Brinker and with Duffy and with Schmaltz. The studio's behind us 107%. They agree it's the greatest publicity stunt in this cockeyed town's cockeyed history. Don't be vulgar, dear. Are you telling me that Hollywood isn't cockeyed? It is, and you know why? Well, uh, uh, it's because actors have agents like you, and agents don't have blood in their veins, only crazy publicity stunts. Me dedicate a children's home. In where? Beaver, Ohio. Oh, brother. And a neater idea I never did have. I can see it now. The small town, ivy-covered cottages, the old church clock peeling on the hour, simple folk wending their way home through elm-shaded streets after a day of honest toil. I think I'm going to be sick. <laughs> no, no, it's terrific. You, David Stanley, in this warm, earthy setting, being warm and earthy. Setting? <clears throat> Kit, for three years you've been my agent. You've wangled appointments and pushed me through doors. You've beat bosses over their egg-shaped heads. You've had me seen in the right places with the right people. When nobody else would touch you. Now, remember that, David. Mm. The day you walked into my office, I said to myself, that boy could be sensational. I believed in you, didn't I? I fought a one-woman war to get you into the studio, didn't I? And and screamed like a mother tiger until I got your decent parts, didn't I? Sure. Okay. I I am appealing to your better nature. I hear you, but I don't feel anything. (laughs) Kit, I'm an actor. Well, we won't argue. <clears throat> I never dedicated anything in my life, and I won't start now, especially with kids. I don't get along with kids. I- I'm allergic to them. Haven't you ever held a tiny baby in your arms? No, have you? Once, with disastrous results. <laughs> So you admit it. But these kids are from 5 to 12. Orphans with no families, no homes, no nothing. I'll mail them a check in the morning. In the morning, you'll be on a train aimed straight at Beaver, Ohio. Not me. You forced me to remind you of a contract. Section B, paragraph 13, clause 9. In big, bold letters, it says that I am the sole and exclusive owner of the right to decide where, when, and how you shall be publicized. If I wanted you to crawl on your hands and knees down Hollywood Boulevard, you'd crawl. If I wanted you to swim to Catalina, you'd swim. And if I want you to dedicate a children's home in Badger, Ohio, Dad, blame it, you'll dedicate. You said Beaver, Ohio. Beaver, Badger, Skunk Hollow, you'll go there, friend, and like it. It's a mournful sound. 
probably announcing our arrival to the inmates of Beaver. When do we land? In a couple of minutes. Porter has our luggage. He'll, he's all ready to throw it off. Throw it off? Well, the train doesn't actually stop at Beaver, they tell me. <laughs> he just pauses long enough to snort. Great. It's a lovely entrance, I'll make, won't I? Everybody in the county at the station and me flying off the train smack onto my face. Not your face, David. We'll need that for photographs. Fine. Now, buck up. Be public-spirited. Be happy. I am. Why not? You got your way. Think of the sweet little tots you'll be sponsoring, sending them off on the road of life. Mm. And giving them the right to happiness. Don't make me cry, dear. My mascara, you know. Who brings joy into the world? Children. What's nearest every man's heart? Children. What's nearest every woman's heart? Me? Children. (laughs) Now, you might mention that to the crowd at the station. You mention it. It drips off you like coating off a candied apple. Kit, you aren't serious about that stuff, are you? Well, that's us. Come on, David. Got your hat? Yes, Mama. Now, don't try to do any bowing until we reach solid ground. Hey, where's the conductor? Well, I haven't bumped into him since he asked me for your autograph. I told him he couldn't write. Well, there's an open door. Where's the porter? I don't see our luggage anywhere. My striped trousers are in the alligator bag. I know, I know. We can always get me another alligator. Oop! Oh, hey, oof. It, it, it's moving. Hurry up, kid. Stand back. I'll jump first. Every man for himself, huh? I'll catch you. It's a cinch. I did it in Texas Bandit when the heroine was on the train. And yeah, I... yeah, I saw the picture. Do something. Up. Up and away. Hey. Okay, jump, kid. Jump. Oh, David. Jump. Jump. Don't leave me alone in Beaver. All right. Don't rush me. Here I come. All right. I'll catch you. Ooh. Hang on. Uh, don't worry. Don't worry. I've got you, I think. Uh, Who was griping about an entrance? That was colossal. What a man, Stanley. Put me down, David. Oh, sure. Thank you. Well, shouldn't the band be striking up? Shouldn't... Hey, look. Look at what? David. Is this Beaver? Good night. We got off at the wrong place. No, there's the sign on the depot. But where is everybody? This is the day, isn't it? This is the day. Platform's empty. As a tomb. Worse, empty as last year's love affair. Well, that shows how your mind works. David, this is terrible. Uh, we... e- excuse me. What? Who? Well. Well, well, well. <laughs> Hello? Mr. Stanley? Yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Save it, David. We can get paid for that. <laughs> I'm here to meet you, Mr. Stanley. On behalf of Beaver, I wish to welcome Can't you to... Can Beaver speak for itself? A what? Oh, this is my agent, Miss Kit Marshall. Oh, likewise. <laughs> Where is Beaver? Beyond the hill. Burrowing away like mad, no doubt. I mean, where's the citizenry? Where's the woman's club? Where's the janitor? Where's the mayor? He's home. I'm his daughter. She's the mayor's daughter, kid. She's the mayor's daughter, and I'm the traveling... Never mind. (laughs) Um, You're the Miss Marshall who wrote to my father, I guess. I guess. We had a gigantic correspondence. Plans were laid, beautiful plans, all about receptions and speeches and flowers and things. We practically fell in love with each other. Well, I talked to Daddy. I told him as far as Mr. Stanley was concerned, he was coming here for the dedication simply because he adores children. I told Daddy Mr. Stanley wouldn't want any publicity. And what did Daddy say? Oh, he said that was right. No publicity. We wouldn't soil a warm, earthy gesture with publicity. Not a word to the paper, not a word to the town. Nobody knows you're in Beaver, Mr. Stanley. Not a single soul. Isn't that wonderful? Let me at her. Get. Let me at her. Get. I'll clip no, her. She'll help you. David, I'll tear her limb from limb. And the curtain comes down on the first act of tonight's play in the little theater off Times Square. Smoking in the outer lobby or downstairs? Smoking in the outer lobby. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Vincent Pelletier with an important message. For the Republicans, it's Eisenhower and Nixon. For the Democrats, it's still a race to see who will come out ahead in party favor. This week is all important for the Democratic Party as they hold their national convention in Chicago. And you, the listener, will want to hear every history-making development on this station direct from the Democratic National Convention beginning tomorrow. NBC's Ace News staff and technical crew, more than 300 people, will bring you all of the news as it happens throughout the convention city tomorrow and every day of the convention. Be sure to make this NBC station your convention headquarters. Keep yourself up to date 
Attend the Democratic Convention on NBC. Second verse. The first nighters are hurrying down the aisles to their seats. The lights are dim, and here's the second act of Speak Ever So Gently. I'll show you to your rooms. Peter will bring your luggage up later. The house is yours, Mr. Stanley. You don't know how we've looked forward to having you as our guest. Well, that's very kind of you, Miss... Uh... Oh, gracious, I didn't introduce myself, did I? Let's everybody call everybody Butch. <laughs> My name's Roxanne Horton. Roxanne? Well, that's different. Mm-hmm. It's uh, from the play Cyrano de Bergerac. Mama was reading it when I was born. <laughs> Cyrano was the guy with the tremendous nose, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. Mama said Daddy reminded her of Cyrano. So romantic and all. Uh, Are the ladies in your family partial to romance? (laughs) Well, we wouldn't snub it if it tapped us on the shoulder. (laughs) So often, romance pokes you square in the teeth. That's my thought for the day. Are you speaking from experience, Miss Marshall? From observation, Miss Horton. Well, uh, this is your room, Mr. Stanley. Thank you. Hey, wait. Wait, I think you made a mistake. That's the zoo. The zoo? Animals, millions of animals in there. Shut the door quick. They might stampede. Shut the door. They're dead. Dead? Yes, and stuff. Daddy's hunting trophies. I had them moved from the den into your room. From your last picture, I thought that... You do like animals, don't you? The movie magazines are always pointing out how fond you are of dogs and horses and lions and things. Come in. Honestly, they're dead. Are you sure? Well, touch one. No, thanks. This is Alfred. A... A... A tiger? Mm-hmm. Daddy shot him in Asia. He measures six and a quarter feet. Oh, that's nice. A- and look, over the mantle. What's that? Your father? <laughs> it's a moose head. Well, I didn't know. Cyrano de Bergerac and everything. I hope you'll be very comfortable in here, Mr. Stanley. All of you. Well, listen, I, I hate to crowd them. Wouldn't it be better if I... Uh... Well, there must be a hotel, even in Beaver. Oh, we wouldn't think of it. Why, Dad, it'd be heartbroken if you didn't stay with us. So would I. Well. Luncheon's at one. You'll have time to rest before then. Rest? With these ghouls staring at me? <laughs> Couldn't close an eye. Bears and foxes and elephants and coyotes. Oh, that isn't a coyote, Mr. Stanley. It's a wolf. Relax, David. You're among friends. <laughs> Your room is across the hall, Miss Marshall. I'll show you. Oh, Kit. Kit, you wouldn't desert me. Suppose they came to life or something. Me, all alone and unarmed. Caught like a rat in a trap. Kit. David. I have only one thing to say to you. What? Roll! <laughs> Here, Miss Marshall. Uh, will this be all right? Oh, thank you. It's perfect. It isn't lavish, I'm afraid. I have very simple taste, Miss Horton, in everything. In food, in clothes, in acting. Really? Now, uh, look, Sugar, you aren't going to overdo it, are you? Overdo what? This small-town character batting your eyes at the station, turning David's room into a taxidermist's dream, deciding that he isn't here for anything except his desire to express a great love for children. The dedication ceremony is tomorrow afternoon, Miss Marshall. Yes. Luncheon's at one. And meanwhile, Roxy, I'll have me a bit of a whirl through beaver. Mercy, what a way to die. Hello. Oh, say, this is a beautiful drugstore you have. A chocolate soda, please. They're my favorites. They're David Stanley's favorites, too. David Stanley, the movie actor? He's at the mayor's house, you know. My, what an enterprising little bank this is. Such nice, clean money. Will you cash this check for me? It's drawn against David Stanley's account in Hollywood. David Stanley? Oh, yes. He's here in Beaver. May I use your telephone? I want to call David Stanley. No, no, not long distance. He's at the mayor's house. Well, he certainly is. Call up yourself if you don't believe me. The whole town's upside down. How could they have found out he was here at our house? I can't imagine. Oh, Daddy's going crazy. <laughs> They've swarmed into his office from every side. Oh, not again. I won't answer it. I just won't answer it. It's been ringing every ten seconds for the past three hours. Fun, isn't it? Fun. I'm losing my mind. Hey, the people standing under my window leering at me. Why don't you answer that telephone? Oh. Hello? 
Yes, Mrs. Ferguson, I'll ask him. Mr. Stanley, do you want to speak to the garden club? No, I have rose fever. No, Mrs. Ferguson, he has rose fever. Oh, what's that? People. Scads and scads of people, all panting for David Stanley. Well, don't sit there smirking at me. They've got the house surrounded. We're cut off. Reinforcements couldn't possibly get through. Now you know how Custer felt at Bunker Hill. Valley Forge. The Alamo. Okay, okay. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, yes, Miss Horton. This is what you get for having anything to do with a celebrity. They'll be climbing in the windows any minute now. Oh, come on, come on. We can sneak out the back way. With David's public clamoring for him, don't be silly. He can have his public and his public can have him. Only first go with me to the children's home. The ceremony's tomorrow. You'll have to see to it everything's in order. There won't be any time if they get hold of it. Yeah, him. that's an idea, Kit. Maybe you better. You come too, Mr. Stanley. Oh, that phone. <laughs> the office, Miss Marshall. Hey, didn't I hear children? Yes, there's several of them in the home. We couldn't wait for Mr. Stanley's kiss before we opened the doors. Mm, you really must try not to be bitter, dear. Kit. Oh, Kit. Uh-oh, when he wails, he's in trouble. Kit, look. What? What have you got there? Hello. I haven't got her. She's got me. All of a sudden, there she was. I don't know where she came from. Hello, Millie. Uh, 290, please. What are you doing? Uh, calling my father. Millie, shouldn't you be in bed? <sighs> no, ma'am. Well, those are pajamas you're wearing, aren't they? Millie, could I have my finger, please? Kit, she's got a stranglehold on my finger. <laughs> she won't bite you. He's pretty, isn't he? Mmm, just like peppermint candy. Go for heaven's sake. If you sit down, I'll sit in your lap. No, you don't. Go on, David, it won't hurt you. Is your name David? I guess so. Uh, would you try again? Then? Let Millie sit on your lap. How old are you? Ten thousand and six. I mean Millie. I'm five and a half. That's it. Jump right up there. Oh. Well, David, she becomes you. I'm not in the least maternal. But did you ring? Hello? Hello, Father? You smell nice, David. Hmm. I do? <laughs> Daddy, we're at the home now. We came in the back door so nobody saw us. You get right down here as fast as you can. Mr. Stanley can do his dedicating tonight. What? Hurry, Daddy. Now, you listen to me. You can't... Marshall, if you think I'll let you use these children for publicity purposes, you're mistaken. You're... What was that, Daddy? Give me that phone. What? Millie, where'd you get so many freckles? I haven't got any freckles. Well, sure you have. What? What's the matter? Measles. Measles? Measles? Here in the home? Uh... Quarantine this afternoon. Measles? David, drop that child. <laughs> And the curtain comes down in the second act of tonight's play in the little theater of Times Square. Smoking downstairs or in the outer lobby, please. Smoking downstairs. And here, ladies and gentlemen, once more, Vincent Pelletier. Remember, friends, beginning tomorrow, the NBC Radio Network will once again begin its complete, comprehensive coverage of an important news event as the Democratic National Convention convenes in Chicago. For the best coverage of the Democratic National Convention, you'll want to set your radio dial to this NBC station. Here you will find NBC's core of 300 experts ready to bring you every news event as it happens. At the microphones will be Ben Grower, Morgan Beatty, Bob Considine, George Hicks, Ray Henley, W.W. W. Chaplin, and H.B. Kaltenborn, to mention only a few of NBC's top news reporters. Tomorrow, then, be sure to tune here for the opening session... And then keep tuned to this station for further convention coverage. Attend the Democratic Convention on NBC. Curtain! Last curtain! The first nighters are all in their seats ready for the last act. And there goes the curtain. Cheapers. And these freckles on Millie's face aren't freckles, they're measles. David, we've got to get out of here. You can't? I'd like to see anybody stop us. Oh, we're quarantined for two weeks. Daddy says there's a sign on the door. Yeah, so you have to bring us in by the back door. I'll bet David's last dollar you knew about the measles. I did not. If you think I deliberately arranged it so I'd have to spend the next two weeks with a couple of publicity-hungry Hollywood... Listen, Miss Horton, we don't grab at publicity skirts because we're crazy about the old girl. We're simple people. Mm, but as simple as TNT. Can I have some, David? Not until you're older, dear. Listen, we've got to get out of this place. <clears throat> Look, I'm the mayor's daughter. You said that. It wouldn't do for the mayor's daughter and the mayor's guest to run around town spreading measles. Go ahead, enjoy yourself. Would anybody mind if I had a screaming fit? No, not at all. Yep. 
You feel better? No. What's she yelling about, David? I don't know, Millie. She doesn't either. Now, look, Miss Horton, uh, for Roxanne, maybe you'd like a screen test. Flattery will get you nowhere. But nobody knows we're here. We could get up. Oh, hello. Uh, yes, Mr. Beacons. Who's Mr. Beacons? Editor of the paper. Oh, lovely. Yes, Mr. Beacons. Oh, he did, did he? Your father told him about this. Uh, yes, Mr. Beacons. The minute Mr. Stanley knew the children had measles, he rushed right in like Lockenvar. His horse is parked at the curb. Oh, naturally, Mr. Beacons. He'll work his fingers to the bone to nurse them back to health. You may phone that message to the Associated Press. Uh, Goodbye, Mr. Beacons. Top that one, Roxy. Uh, how many children are there? Nine, besides Millie. Kit. And no nurses and no doctors. Just Mrs. Walker, who's in charge. Oh. You can work a finger to the bone for each of the ten children. Well, Top that one, Miss Marshall. Oh, this is all your fault. Hey, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, honey, what's this? Millie, don't cry. What's everybody mad for? Now, there, you see, you've scared Millie. Don't cry, honey. Oh, Millie, don't be upset. I, I assure you we are not displeased with you. We are not displeased with you. My heavens, you don't talk to a child like that. Come on, Millie, darling. Let Roxanne tuck her little angel into bed. Hmm? No, I want David. David! Sure, honey, I've got you. Come on now. Now, where's your room, Freckles? Or, measles? <laughs> As a child psychologist, you're a good mayor's daughter. Kit! Kit, are you in the basement? Yes, David, over by the laundry tub. What are you doing? What? What are you doing? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Boiling the sheets, huh? What? It says you're boiling the sheets, huh? The people who discovered malaria have nothing on me. What? Never mind. I don't know what I'm saying. David, you don't have to scrub the floor on your knees. I've got dishpan hands. Why not dishpan knees? Did you finish the ironing? Mm -hmm. Oh, my back's killing me. Hi. Hello, kid. Hi. Well, Roxanne, when they let you out of the salt mines. <laughs> <laughs> Do I look that bad? Listen, no, none of us can complain about looks. <laughs> what a week. Bobby finally broke out. He must have been exposed before we isolated him. Don't you hate me when I get so technical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Miss Walker, I'll have the kids' supper trays ready by now. I'll take Millie's tour. I wonder why he feels he has to do that every night, Kit. He doesn't want to lose a good thing. Chances are that Millie shares her supper with him. She does. I got all the cake frosting, so there. Yes, Mr. Horton, I'm, I'm glad you phoned. Everything's under control. Children are coming along beautifully. We haven't dropped a stitch. Yes, only two more days and it'll be over. We'll never forget Beaver, believe me. Uh, well, the dedication ceremony day after tomorrow. Well, I, I don't know, Mr. Horton. I, I've got to talk to David about it. He and Roxanne are tucking the kids in for the night. Let me ring you back in half an hour, will you? for, David. Sarah had to have a drink of water. Yeah, she always does. Is Millie asleep? I think so. Cute, isn't she? Mm -hmm. Ah, now go to sleep, honey. The princess is waiting for you. Princess? It's a story we have. You've been telling Millie bedtime stories. Sure. I'm pretty handy at it, too. She'll miss you, David. We all will. I... I think I should apologize. I was very wrong about you. I thought you were coming to Beaver just because it would make good copy for the papers and... Roxanne. No, now let me say it. It seems so cheap to me using the children that way... I was sure they didn't mean anything to you. Well, I was wrong. These past two weeks, you've been wonderful. And the kids love you. You can't fool them. You couldn't fool little Millie. And you couldn't fool me, David. You're... You're a very real person. 
Would you care if I kissed you? Salute, senor. Salute, Roxanne. Oh, kid. Oh, I, uh, I, I was, I didn't mean to, I just hadn't be passing. I... Well, well I, I was uh, apologizing to David. Yeah, a very thorough apology. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind? No. I've got to explain something, Roxanne. I know you, you like David and he likes you, so don't blame him for any of this. It, it was for publicity, but it was my idea. David objected like a mule the whole time. It was cheap. And there you have my epitaph. However, there'll be no ceremony, no blowing of horns, no crowds, no speeches. Oh, but, Kit, if it would help, you deserve it. No, nope, no ceremony. These kids, well, you can't feed them and bathe them, and take their temperatures and play games and try to wish every measles spot off of them without... Oh, call me soft-headed. Go on, call me soft-headed. But soft-hearted, do. Me? Don't be silly. Not old 10% Marshall. I never had a heartbeat in my life. It was good of Roxanne to come to the station with us. Yeah. Well, David, on to Hollywood, huh? Yep. Yeah. Wouldn't the boys at the studio laugh if they found out what we've been doing? Yeah. Ha ha, like that. A beaver wasn't a bad town, was it? No, Kit, it wasn't. Kit, I've got to go back. Back? Back to Beaver, I've got to. Yeah. Yeah, I, I rather expected you would. You're in love with her, aren't you? Am I? They were the happiest two weeks I've ever known. She was swell all through it, wasn't she? Swell. She kissed me goodnight every night. Oh? Yeah, can you imagine that? Yes, I can imagine that. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Not a thing. I'm, I'm very, very glad for oh, you. Oh, Kit, she and I will have a great time. I can adopt her. Ad adopt her? I, are you insane? Insane? You'll have to marry her. Marry her? <laughs> you couldn't adopt her, David, for heaven's sake. Why couldn't I? Why, she's 23 if she's a day. 20... <clears throat> She's five and a half. What? What? What are you talking about? Millie. Millie. Well, certainly. Oh, David. Kit, did you think I meant... You did. You thought I meant Roxanne. And you didn't like it, did you? Like it? Kit, I've waited three years to see that look on your face. David. Oh, David, give me room, darling. I'm breaking up into little pieces. Mm. Maybe I'd better hold you together. Please. David. David. You do smell nice. <laughs> Turn around here. Oh, brother, you said it. There it is, ladies and gentlemen, the premier performance of what looks like a new hit play on the Great White Way at the Little Theater off Times Square. Miss Lottie and Mr. Soleil are taking bows. They've called Betty New Jersey to the wing. Now they're joined by Mary McGovern, and the audience is giving them a great ovation. Next week, we hope you join us again and bring your friends to hear a gay and whimsical comedy called The Three Dwarfs. You'll find it amusing and delightful. I'll count on seeing you next week at this same time. Now we move out of the theater and into the street. Here's your cab, Mr. First Nighter. Thank you. Good night. The First Nighter program starring Olin Soule and Barbara Luddy is a copyrighted radio feature produced and directed by Joseph T. Ainley. Tonight's play was pure fiction and did not refer to real people or actual events. This is NBC.